Many thanks for that kind introduction, setting a high bar. Hopefully, hopefully we will uh, live up to it, and also for the invitation uh, to speak to you today. Um, what I'm going to try and do, I've got about 20 minutes. Um, hopefully, if there are uh, areas we want to probe more, we'll get time in the panel uh, later. But I just wanted to give a bit of an insight into four practical case studies of what does this look like in, uh, in, sort of, uh, in practice. So a lot of the starting principles for applying these tools uh, within government and, and, and outside of that is, <clears throat> sorry, how do we try and create more nuanced models and methods in the way that we go about influencing behavior? Uh, and the four examples I'm going to try and give you today, hopefully there are, uh, uh, they resonate with you, um, either in their method or their particular policy application. So I'm going to talk through uh, some work relating to uh, energy demand, um, some work related to creating more diverse, inclusive, uh, and productive workforces. I'm going to talk in the health space, particularly about antimicrobial resistance, uh, and finally around uh, sexism and sexual harassment. Uh, three of these are sort of new results. So if you've ever been bored uh, by, by me talking to you before, hopefully you won't have heard them because they're sort of fresh off the press. Uh, and the, the one in the health space is one that there are some really interesting, I think, exciting replications and adaptations, which I'll, which I'll nod to as well. And just to mention, the, the four case studies I'm going to talk about today are really sort of single trials um, designed really to illustrate what this can look like in practice, as I said. But of course, it's usually part of a much broader work program, which is coming at it from a few different sort of perspectives. Uh, and hopefully, I think John um, and, uh, and Luke are going to talk a little bit more about the sort of systems approach to this. And hopefully, in the, in the discussion after, we can get into a, a bit more of a discussion about how these specific trials and interventions relate to broader programs of, of work. I'm also just going to draw on the EAST framework. Um, again, this is a framework we tend to use with uh, a lot of our clients, which has been developed. We've sort of run, I think, several hundred um, uh, RCTs and evaluations now. Uh, and of course, given your background in social marketing, you know that behavior is complex and changing behavior is hard, right? If we think about any of our own behavior, <laughs> we know it's hard. Uh, and the literature is deep and it comes from many different places. So this is just a very simple mnemonic to think about what have we found over the past 10 years are the key levers that work. And in general, we have found that if you make it easy, attractive, social, and timely, uh, for, for people to make those changes, you're much more likely to have a, a, an impact. So I'll talk through a couple of examples that speak to an element uh, of each of those parts of the framework. And again, if you want to find out more about that framework, you can, you can find it uh, online. So the first, first example, and, and again, if there's one thing that you take away from today, this is the sort of mantra that in the Behavioral Insights team we sort of uh, hit people over the head with, is that if you want someone to do something, the first step should always be to make it easy. And again, that sounds very trite, but if you look at government services and often corporate structures, again, they are designed around our own bureaucracies and hierarchies. And often the reason that people aren't doing what you want to do is because you haven't made it particularly easy to do so. So we do lots of work. We're almost obsessive about thinking about how do you reduce these frictions in the systems and the processes that we design, and how can you think about simple changes to defaults and prompts, et cetera. An example I'm going to talk today uh, is a program of work um, around uh, uh, creating more diverse, inclusive, productive workforces. We've looked at this from a few different angles. So we've done everything from trying to increase applications from minority groups uh, to the police through to encouraging um, more women to reapply for senior management roles in the public sector. This particular trial is just looking to try to increase the uptake of flexible work. Uh, and we did a sort of data grab, and um, this was back in the, in the UK, and we found that um, only 10% of jobs that were advertised on these sort of job uh, promotion websites, only 10% were explicitly advertised as flexible. Now, it's not that if you went through that process, you might not be able to secure flexible work, but they weren't explicitly advertised as flexible working being uh, an option. So we did some work with a, a, a big private uh, provider uh, in this space, and we simply added one prompt page to their process, essentially. So when you go on to advertise a job through this website, you have to fill in all the information uh, about the job. And we simply added a set of prompts that asked them what flexible work uh, arrangements uh, are possible that they could simply tick. And there were various ones in there, including sort of job share, part-time, compressed hours, uh, various different options. Or you could click, you know, f flexible work uh, is, not, is, not, uh, is not available for this role. And so that's what it felt like from the employer perspective. If you then think about it, what it looks like when you're applying for a job, instead of just seeing the sort of general uh, uh, information that you see about 
what the role is, where it is, what the salary is, what sort of experience you would need. There was an explicit part that also said explicitly the type of flexible work that you would be able to expect. And again, we were interested to see to what extent this would, A, uh, employers would engage in that, but also what impact it would then have in terms of job applications. Uh, and uh, the good news is that uh, it seemed to have a pretty, pretty decent uplift. So you can see there about 7 percentage point, about 20% increase in jobs op offering flexible working simply with this additional prompt. So it's not that employers are necessarily against flexible work or that you couldn't have it. It's just that the systems that we've created aren't prompting people at the right moment to think about explicitly advertising it uh, in that way. And what did it do uh, in terms of applicants? Again, this is a, one of those nice stories where it's a win-win. So not only were more jobs being advertised that were explicitly flexible, but those jobs that were advertised as flexible were then attracting more applicants. So again, you can see just a really very, very, very simple process change can dramatically or, or significantly increase the proportion uh, of both people applying for jobs and jobs being advertised with flexible work. So we think, and we're now working with both private and public sector, to think about how can we encourage this greater use, greater advertisement, and then greater uptake of flexible work. Of course, once you have then secured that job, there is lots of work to then work with managers and others to make sure that you're able to uh, uh, actually undertake that work in the way that uh, you intend. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that we have found for a lot of our research is that for flexible work and, and lots of other uh, uh, lots of other uh, programs, you get this sort of high-level buy-in from you know, senior management, but it actually f is it's where in the middle management is where that it stops. And so a lot of our work is sort of targeting line managers now to think about, for example, we did some analysis, uh, supported some analysis in the public sector that showed that your biggest determinant of when you get, arrive and leave from work was, you can all imagine, your line manager, right? There's such an important uh, uh, sort of influence on that behavior that it's them you need to target. And whether you can have discussions about whether you're ready for promotion, uh, whether you can have flexible working, a lot of that gets stuck at the line manager level. So there's lots of work to now build on this to think about how do we target once people get in the door that they are able to progress in the way that, that we want. Second area of work that we always think about is how do you actually make it attractive for people uh, to change their behavior? What messages can you use? How can you personalize uh, your comms? Uh, how do you create incentives in the right way? Uh, and this is the piece of work that I've talked about that is a couple of years old now, but is tackling a really you know, growing global problem, antimicrobial resistance. So we know that this is a looming health problem, um, that this resistance will have, take a sort of huge toll, uh, both from a sort of economic and, and a social point of view. And one of those drivers is a behavioral one. It is that doctors overprescribe medicine. We know that when we're all feeling a bit sick, we go in to our doctors and we want to feel like we've been given something to, to walk out with. And there is inappropriate prescribing and then people don't finish their course. So some of the work that we've been looking to do, uh, both here in Australia, New Zealand and the UK, is to think about how do we tackle the behavioral part of that problem around overprescription. Um, and I also just wanted to call out here that um, the Public Health England originally uh, set up um, an intervention in this space, a sort of comms and marketing program, which was looking at... Uh, trying to highlight to people why this was such an issue. And they were really brave and, I think, and innovative in this in that they actually ran a randomized control trial. So they put up this cons material in some GP surgeries and not others and then tracked what it did to prescription rates over time. And what did they find? Actually, it made no difference. And in fact, actually, there was a slight directional trend to an increase in prescription, right? And it, even when you look back now, it's very easy in hindsight so for us all to pick problems that there might be in this program. But it was universally seen that it was a pretty sensible campaign, right? But to me, it underlines this deeper point that often we don't know what will work in practice. Even the best design campaigns and thoughts, et cetera, aren't always effective in practice. So what are the ways that we can make sure that we are measuring uh, actual behavior uh, and impact? And off the back of that, we were then uh, allowed to do a piece of work which was basically sending a letter so we identified the top prescribers, the top 20% uh, of prescribing GP practices in the UK, and we were able to write them a letter from the chief medical officer which highlighted that they prescribed more than their peers uh, and then highlighted some specific actions that they could take, like giving out delayed prescriptions. So you can give someone a prescription, but they can't use it for a couple of days uh, when, they, when often people then won't cash it in if they don't need it effectively. And what did we see? This did significantly reduce prescriptions because it was much more targeted, uh, and it was to the GP practices. 
The great story about this is not just that, okay, we ran this trial and it's been scaled up in the UK, but there have been further iterations. So the Commonwealth Government and Health Department have run a subsequent trial where they're able to get data not just for the GP practice, but the specific GP, and not just their overall prescribing rates, but the prescribing rates for sp specific drugs. And they found an even greater uh, impact, and we're also now replicating and adapting this in New Zealand, where we're getting differential information also for Maori Pacifica populations, where we know the trends are also quite different. Um, so this, I think, is just a really nice example of how the field can learn from each other, build on each other's evidence, uh, and take it further. Uh, next is around social. How do we use social norms and networks uh, in order to uh, uh, change behavior? And this one is, you know, again, a really complex and, and uh, pressing issue, particularly for those in the room today, given universities. You remember the uh, Human Rights Commission brought out a report saying that one in four students on Australian campuses had, uh, uh, had experienced sexual assault. Uh, but that only one in five people take action when they see it. You know, these are really worrying, worrying statistics. It's really hard to know what exactly you can do. And again, it is, we are doing lots of work to think about how do you set the right policy frameworks, how do you get the right reporting frameworks. There's also lots of work going on to think about things like bystander programs. If people don't take action, how do you get them to take action? But some of that work is not, again, is sort of, you know, we'll, we'll do a quick sort of workshop on it or a, a campaign. And often, actually, it doesn't think through, well, actually, do people know what action they should take in different circumstances? And in some circumstances, that have been shown that, um, much like some diversity training, if, if you don't get it quite right, it can backfire. Um, so we've been doing uh, some work um, with the university in Victoria to think about, okay, what are the, op what, what are the different um, options you can do in this space? Uh, and in there, we co-designed uh, an email campaign series, so uh, uh, half a dozen emails that went to students and staff, about 30,000, which basically highlighted some of these uh, statistics uh, and then talked them through some actions that they could take as a bystander. Uh, and again, what did we see? Uh, significant increases in terms of people who had received the email. So again, we randomly selected. Some people received this uh, uh, email campaign. The other half didn't receive uh, the emails. And again, you saw in terms of those that reported uh, witnessing sexual harassment, an increase in people who took some action. And again, that action could be different. It can be reaching out to the victim. It can be reporting. There are different actions that's beneath that. But we saw an, an increase uh, in, in action. And again, really promising. This is, again, scratching the surface somewhat. There's a much bigger program of work that needs to go on. And beneath these headlines, results, there are also some slightly more depressing results, particularly as a man, um, that say this was effective for both genders. In terms of witnessing and taking action on sexism, um, actually that didn't seem to work for men. And actually men seem to notice sexism much less. Um, so there's lots of work that needs to be done to educate people like myself and others um, uh, in the room to think about actually what, what does sexism look like in a day-to-day -day context and what could and should we be doing to call that out. So lots of interesting work, I think, in areas which are becoming uh, increasingly complex. And a very similar campaign, I haven't really got time to talk about this in, in any detail, but 911 handlers, in the, this is from the US, you get huge burnout, problems with retention. You can sort of understand, right? You're working often independently, you're taking and hearing horrific things. There's often a lack of feedback loop about what you're hearing. You see very similar things here in Australia around things like child protection, call centers, where you're just hearing horrific stuff. Um, you know, there is a lack of feedback to know what happens, and there isn't much peer support. Again, simple email trial where they shared experiences, essentially, uh, uh, and strategies for dealing with them. Again, a reduction uh, in burnout and an increase in retention. Uh, and my final example comes from the uh, energy space. Ag again, we know um, there's a, uh, a huge issue uh, uh, that all of us need to tackle in terms of reducing our, our energy use. And in fact, some of the very earlier, I'm sure everyone in this room will be very familiar with things like O-Power, um, where you were given feedback about your usage as a household and compared it to peers, uh, and that showed to have sort of modest but important increase uh, impacts on your household use, decreasing energy use over time. Uh, but the problem is actually mu much of the cost, et cetera, comes at peak times, okay? And generally they are summer days, you know, between three and six, when not only are all the air conditioning on in the office, they're also on at home with these huge spikes, which mean these emergency uh, power plants, et cetera. So what can you do in order to tackle your energy use, not just overall, but at these absolutely crucial times? And we work with uh, a private provider in this spot, PowerShop, uh, who have their program called Curb Your Power, which is essentially you can sign up to it and say, you send me messages, you give me a nudge effectively at, this, uh, at these key times, and I'll set a target for what I can reduce my energy by. And you get a prompt. If you reach those targets, you're also entered into some sort of small rewards as well. 
Uh, and what did we see? Uh, we saw that there was sort of marginal impacts of trying to frame, frame those messages in different ways. What was really powerful, actually, was just defaulting people who hadn't signed up for that program into the program. And again, you can see from a private provider, they were quite nervous about this. They were saying, well, hang on, people haven't signed up to this, so we, we can't really, we don't re we're not really sure we want to roll out the program. It might have big impacts in terms of customer satisfaction. We'll get lots of complaints. We monitored that. No complaints, effectively. People were happy. They just hadn't got round to signing up. And actually, it was these people that it felt slightly more novel for. And actually, you found that overall, these people had slightly higher energy use. So the, uh, the ability for them to make bigger changes was also there. So again, for this is just for us the, an example of how you can send these timely messages, but it is important to think about actually when you're thinking about scale and impact, how do you understand where you're going to get the biggest uh, bang for your buck? But sort of, uh, just very quickly before I finish up, I've given sort of four um, examples here where there has been a positive result, right? And of course, that like publication bias is what you'll hear at many conferences, but a lot of things won't work. Right? And I just want to, again, highlight the fact that that is OK. And the more edgy and difficult areas that we get into, that is going to increasingly be OK. And we're actually doing some work internally at the minute to work out what our sort of hit rate is or success rate. Uh, and my sense is, over time, it will go down as we get into harder and harder problems. But generally, the, the sort of published one that we refer to is the Education Endowment Foundation in the UK, which has now funded hundreds of trials. They have a hit rate of about one in four. So one in four of the uh, programs that they uh, fund are successful. And that is kind of the dirty secret of government, is that most things, and actually this is, most things we're doing, we don't know if it works. And even dirtier <laughs> secret is that actually it's more likely than not that it's not having an impact. Okay? So there is a slightly sort of hard fact that we all need to face up to. And when we are using these new tools and exciting methodologies, there are lots of things which I think Luke and John are going to talk about, which stack the odds in our favor. And I actually get slightly annoyed when people sort of use that stick and say, well, we don't really know what works. Let's just go out there and test stuff. That's not the case. We should be doing the system thinking. We should be co-designing with local people to give ourselves the maximum chance of success. But let's not also lose sight of the fact that if we are pushing the boundaries, th some things won't work. And we should measure things to make, make sense of that. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll probably cover that. Um, I'll probably cover this more in the, the panel session. But for me, think about where next. There's sort of three, three different areas that I think are, are, are really important to think about. One is methods. Uh, and again, I think you'll have found, for, certainly for me personally, as an organization, we have become, uh, we, we use a, a much greater uh, diversity of methods than when we started, where uh, in order to push that, you know, we need to do impact evaluations, we need to find out if something works, and we need to run a randomized control trial. Um, we, we push that really, really hard. And we, that is still the backbone of what we do. And wherever we go, we will try to run those types of interventions that can be robustly evaluated. But as our data gets better, and it links to the second, the second point, actually we were able to try different types of tools. We were able to run more experimental methods. We were able to do run trials and do tests, lab experiments before you get into the field. And you can also combine it again with the tools that I think Luke and, and John are going to talk a little bit more. Design tools. Um, we're doing increasing work at the minute to think about the intersection with implementation science. Because often when you see, and you see these results that are often presented, you see the population level effect, right? You don't see who does it work for, not just does it work, but who does it work for and why. How is it delivered in Rockhampton versus Brisbane, in this classroom versus this classroom? And we need to do lots more to unpack these interventions, work, what, how it's working uh, and why. And the last point that I just sort of finish up on because I'm running out is how do we also impact markets, the design and, and, and way that markets operate? You'll have all heard of a nudge, right? Everyone in this room would have heard of a nudge. Who's also heard of sludge? It's an increasingly popular term now is to think about, so nudge is the way that the system is designed ideally to make you uh, achieve the outcomes that you want. Sludge is where systems are designed that make it hard for you to achieve the outcomes that you want. The classic example is where a company sets something, you, you sign up for a free trial, and then they make it extremely hard for you to opt out, right? And the world in government and corporate is increasingly full of sludge. And this is just an example of T's and C's. You know, the, they, are, they are tomes that no one reads. And actually, it was an important judgment by ASIC the other day, which said, even if you have all these T's and C's, if the consumer couldn't really have known, we can still, we can still regulate and punish you. Uh, and there's, of course, a lots of work that we're doing at the minute around social media uh, uh, and that market. I'm just going to ask before I leave, one quick question to the audience. This is some uh, research we've done in the UK. I want a quick guess for which platforms these are. So on the left, you can see very, very bad for things like body image, sleep, FOMO. 
um, uh, etc. Anxiety. On the right, we have another platform. These are two of the most popular platforms for teenagers, which are very bad for your sleep, but slightly better in terms of things like self-expression, self-identity, etc. Any guesses for which this platform is on the left? Instagram, yeah, and on the right? Yeah, good guess, not, not Snapchat, but any others? No, this is YouTube, yeah. Um, and actually, we often, and young people haven't seen this data. They don't know, I mean, they know they use these things. But actually, there is increasing data that we can give to young people to tell them not just, you know, they've heard the messages, yes, we're addicted to our phones, there's a sort of race for our attention, but understanding exactly how these platforms are designed and what impact they have on your well-being, we've actually found uh, extremely powerful. And we are, we are now running uh, a, a pilot uh, with a few hundred students in uh, Victoria and New South Wales, which is essentially taking young people through a series of workshops, about eight workshops, which unpacks all of this, which talks them through, actually, what are the social norms? What is appropriate and not appropriate behaviour online? Because it's not clear, and it is changing, and it's really difficult to talk about. And a lot of schools and teachers, they understand that it's difficult for them to talk about these things, things about sexting and all of those things in the classroom. And often when they do come in, they haven't got the latest evidence and they haven't got the latest information so they'll start talking about you know well when you're on Facebook and the kids are sitting there going like I mean none of us are on Facebook right we're on it to keep our parents happy but that's not what's happening um, and actually we do need to think about how do we create the right messages the right programs and what we've found similar to things with like junk food most young teenagers and young people know that junk food's bad right but if you actually show them the techniques around marketing that is being used to sort of influence their behavior, they're more likely to take action. And that's what we hope uh, in this space is that by showing them and helping them to create their own norms and show how these platforms are working against them, we hope that we can achieve behavior change. Thanks very much.